to start. Today's call is part of a series of Q&As that I do regularly, that I host regularly for members of our Genius community. Sometime I, sometimes I open these calls up, like this one today. And uh, the reason I'm opening it up is because the this is one of those stories that it, it I mean, I, I can't believe so much has happened, or at least we're so aware of so much having happened in so, in so few days, uh, really beginning noon on Friday. So the first person that came to mind is my friend Nathaniel here, who has been uh, the hardest working man in futurism. Uh, he has two podcasts, the original Breakdown, which was, what was the actual name? Was it just called The Breakdown? The Breakdown, yeah. And that was Crypto. And then about a year ago or so, he launched AI, the AI breakdown, and he is the proprietor of the Breakdown Network, which encompasses an assortment of podcasts, including the AI breakdown and other content exploring big picture power shifts. So Nathaniel, just quickly introduce yourself, and then let's get into a series of questions that I have. And I really want to encourage listeners, again, Q&A box. Um, the rules here are simple. Just think about the question very carefully, type it out coherently. And if you have a bunch of questions that you think you're going to ask, try to put them all together so I can easily sort through them because I really want to take audience questions. This is what these calls are about. It's not about uh, me. I do enough of these interviews. It's about you getting your questions in. So Nathaniel, just quick introduction, and then let's start to break this down. Absolutely. I mean, listen, you 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 did a great job. The the thing that I always come back to if I'm if I'm doing this fast is this idea of big picture power shifts. That's always been what's interested in me. I was a history major. I you know I love big patterns of history. It's why Hidden Forces very long uh, been my favorite podcast. And you know, for me, exploring it through sort of media through news analysis is uh is what I've done. So the breakdown, you know, it, it it sort of came out at a time where I was spending all of my time in in and around Bitcoin and crypto, and you know, particularly in the context of what it meant to have a non-sovereign, you know, monetary system and and how that played into other global changes, you know, sort of the fragmentation of the American-led global order and yada, yada, yada. And so, you know, that this sort of, for me, it was a vehicle to explore all those things. And I had a very similar experience around this time last year uh, that that many people did when ChatGPT came out. And, you know, there were a number of other products that were sort of emerging at the same time. There were these, you know, uh, image generation tools that were starting to arise. And, um, you know, I, I had the experience of, of of playing around. I think actually for me, the sort of, un, you know, stable diffusion and mid-journey were, were even more transformative the first time I tried them from the standpoint of just seeing magic presented in in front of my eyes. And I started to explore, you know, all of these new generative AI technologies, got very convinced very quickly that, uh, you know, like me, people were having these zero to one moments where they were understanding that they were going to impact how they worked and what they worked on. And, you know, we're racing to try to figure that out. And that was the sort of genesis of the AI breakdown. So, you know, ever, ever since that show started, which is actually only April, um, believe it or not, uh, I've been, you know, spending every day looking at what's happening, trying to contextualize it, understanding it in, in the context of, you know, the, the new technology itself, but also the you know big sort of economic issues that surround it, policy issues that surround it, social issues that surround it. You know, there's going to be you know a, a million dimensions, which which mm -hmm. obviously is sort of part part of why I think people you know are are, are so intrigued to to spend more time on this. I had a, a personal moment that sort of drove it home for me a little bit. I mean, you have different experiences that drive it home, and I was sent a uh, version of my podcast in Greek which mm -hmm. I can speak Greek and I understand Greek. And it was with a guest who's not Greek, who's Iranian. And they dubbed us two. Now, I know how I sound in Greek, so I didn't sound like I sound. He sounded the way I would have expected him to sound if he was speaking Greek. And it was very good. The The, the generative AI, AI company that did it is run by a Greek person, so he kind of made some edits. But you know, I can see how this is going to quickly get to a place where it's going to be perfect. And it made me realize like two things. One, I've had this idea in my head that I'm really lucky because... I speak English. English is a language that I that can reach lots of people with the podcast. So I have a competitive advantage that this is a language that I understand natively. And then I realized, whoa, we're going to be in a world where people are able to compete with me from any country because they're going to be able to translate into perfect English. And it also made me think about this is a this is an area where, and I feel like you probably have recognized this as well. You want to understand where these trends are going because you want to try and take advantage of them sooner than later. Because, like as an example, I it, as soon as this technology is is up to up to snuff, and that could be really within just a few years, and it probably is in like some of the other languages, it's more difficult in Greek because there isn't as much text on the internet. You can I could take this podcast and I could and I could reach new listeners. You know, I could I could expand my my audience 
because all of a sudden I've translated it into like a hundred different languages, right? Which is like a, a modality of thinking about audience expansion that you wouldn't have otherwise, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I barely had time to sort of wrap my head around this, but it, it feels like translation is actually one of the most solvable things. Like, I mean, it is just really happening. And I don't know what the implications are of mm -hmm. a world where the default will be you get to consume content in whatever language you experiencing the world through, regardless almost of what of what they did. Now, mm -hmm. of course, I think that by and large, content creators will still be the drivers of those change. Like you will opt into using Wondercraft or you know whatever Spotify. You know when when Spotify integrates these types of features to uh, to do that sort of dubbing and translation initially. But I can also see a world where it's platform mediated, you know, and it's just, even if you don't do that, all, all you have to do, it's almost like an opt out for Spotify or something like that, where they're just naturally doing that. And I think there are some pretty profound implications probably of, uh, of, of language ceasing to be a barrier in the way that it's been a barrier for the entire, you know, history of human experience. Well, again, so I, I recommend people follow your work and follow the AI breakdown because you cover these big, these big picture trends. And that's what the podcast is about. So let's, Let's apply your uh, expertise and the things that you spend your time on to this sort of, I mean, this has all the makings of a great story. It has human drama. It's consequential in the sense that it's grappling not only, not only is the industry so important, but it's grappling with some of the sort of, I think, um, some of the decades long themes like the power, the, the, um, tension between entrepreneurs and founders on the one side and the board and investors on the other. Um, and the empowerment of the founder, and also this larger question that's been in the public consciousness for some time now, which is this battle between, though it hasn't been articulated in this way until recently, the battle between the AI safety people and the accelerationists. So give us a recap, starting with, I think it was noon uh, Pacific Standard Time on Friday, that the news broke that Sam uh, Altman had been fired. I almost said Sam Bankman-Fried. <laughs> um, so, so just bring us up to speed. What, when did this start? Uh, and where are we now in this story? I got and what's I, happened in a, between as an aside, I got to tell you, um, I was very happy to not have, uh, ha <laughs> to not be intimately involved with the, the chaotic multi-billion dollar value destruction, Sam episode of, of this November, as opposed to mm -hmm. last year. Um, no, so, so let me give you, I, I was thinking about this. I think let's do maybe the, like, the literal 60 second bullet point version of just what happened so that we can go back and unpeel because there's so many layers. So Dimitri, to your point, noon uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Uh, on, on the East Coast, maybe just, just after, but <laughs> consequentially before the close of markets, let's put it that way, uh, OpenAI, mm -hmm. the, the board announces that Sam Altman has been fired. And this is not a, uh, you know, he's he's leaving to spend time with his, uh, with his family kind of a note. This was a, the board no longer has faith in him because of ways that he's communicated and we don't trust him. And, you know, he's gone. And by the way, Greg Brockman has been demoted from chairman of the board. He's no longer on the board. And he is now uh, going to be just just an employee of the company. We're also, you know, they they elevated uh, CTO or former CTO Mira Marati to the to the CEO position, the interim CEO position, and said, you know, they they'd figure it out from there. This was a neutron bomb. I mean, you know, whatever. Pick your hackneyed language of uh, of a huge, massive explosion for reasons that I think we'll probably spend the rest of this conversation uh, unpacking. But it, it was a the just act one of an incredibly sort of dramatic. Uh, moment. Um, the rest of the night was spent sort of with with people trying to figure out what the hell was going on. There was about, I don't know, a five or six hour period where we hadn't heard from any of the principals involved. Um, and the speculation at that time, I think was, you know, my my interpretation was that there must be something enormously egregious. So like, I thought it was happened. some sex scandal with Chad GBT or something. I didn't even think I didn't even think a sex scandal was a big enough thing. I mean, the 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 amount of sheer value destruction that was going to be created by this seemed to me to be something where either a there was like sam was keeping state secrets or b you know there like agi had literally been invented and you know he had kept it from the board like something of that sort of level of significance it's the only thing that made sense but then as the night wore on we started to get commentary one greg brockman uh quit in flames basically he said you know not a chance i'm sticking around to just be an employee with this and you know sam has sent sort of some nice gracious tweets or whatever but very clearly was 
you know, you could feel <laughs> the intensity of things going on. And part of the reason for that was that it was very clear that no one had been consulted in this. Uh, it doesn't even really seem like council was consulted in this. It was, you know, the investors weren't consulted. Microsoft wasn't consulted. Microsoft did their sort of, you know, a uh, nice little statement kind of a thing where they said, sure, we're excited about the new leadership, you know, excited about this partnership, whatever the thing they have to say, basically, but you can almost feel the, uh, the, the, the happenings going on behind the scenes. So, you know, Friday night, everyone's still grappling with this by Saturday, you know, early to mid afternoon, uh, it, it's clear that this is not a, a done deal, and there are there are battles going on, right? There are conversations. I think The Verge maybe broke it at you know four or five p.m. East Coast time on uh, on Saturday that the board was now actively back in conversations to bring Sam and Greg back, and that as part of that they were demanding you know uh, kind of understandably the re the resignation of the rest of the board. And, you know, we're now kind of at the 24 hour mark of not having had any meaningful explanation from the board around why Sam had been fired, which, of course, just leaves everyone to be speculating wildly about about what it might be. But at that point, you know, 24 hours goes by. The speculation had shifted from, OK, did Sam do something crazy, terrible to was there just some sort of internal power struggle? Um, I think that the most common explanation at this point was around the idea that perhaps there was just some some huge disagreement around safety questions and around risk questions, uh, you know, and and it was started to be sort of interpreted as the you know effective altruists on the one hand versus the accelerationists, the EACCs on the other hand. That sort of started to be what tell people what kind a little of, bit just just for quickly for people that don't know what are the what what do we mean by accelerationists? Accelerationists who sort of you know want uh, who are not scared of the risks of AI and AGI in particular, and think that it leads to a, a world of abundance. Right now, there's infinite variations within that. There's just people who are sort of like broadly techno optimist accelerationists who think that technology is going to be a net good force for humanity, but maybe who still have some questions on the specifics here. There's other people who are like bring on you know the 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 super intelligent gods and let humans be you know, consigned to a sort of a secondary species. I mean, this is, it's not a term that has sort of full, uh, you know, a, a singular meaning. It, it, in fact, I think in some ways right now, what it means is not the guys trying to slow down AI, right? Not the guys trying to to, to pause AI. Um, so you, you we're kind of getting this interpretation of it being a safety issue and, and reinforcing that is the fact that at the center of it seems to be uh, Ilya, who's one of the board members, Ilya Sutskever, who was a, a you know chief scientist at OpenAI, and um, he has expressed you know various concerns. He was at the at the time leading the super alignment team, which was OpenAI's effort to get to actual alignment with super intelligent AGI over the next four years. They had kind of set he also worked under projects. Jeffrey. He he also worked under Jeffrey Hilton, right? Yes, he was at Google. He was and recruited. He had, and Jeffrey had resigned from Google famously yeah. over concerns about safety. Yep. Um, Elon Musk says that his uh, his friendship with Larry Page ended over recruiting Ilya away from Google to mm. uh, to OpenAI originally. You know, way back when it happened. So the Ilya sort of Ilya being at the center of this seemed to reinforce for some people that this was sort of a disagreement around safety questions. But it also kind of started to seem like maybe there was a lot of just the very classic garden variety interpersonal struggle stuff, right? Like Ilya had been demoted about a month ago in terms of how much authority he had, clearly didn't like that. And, and so, you know, personally, I was left wondering, uh, is it actually these AI safety questions or is it not? So going into sort of, you know, Saturday night, we have, uh, you know, what's, what's clear is that there's a sort of a groundswell of people trying to get Sam back in uh, into, you know, in power in, in open AI. There's a sticking point with the board doesn't want to resign, or maybe it's that they, you know, they don't know who's going to be replace them on the board. And so there's a lot of intransigence. And then on Sunday, uh, Sam is back at open AI to actually try to figure this thing out and negotiate. He's in the building. He holds up, you know, he tweets out a picture of him holding a guest badge and says, it's the first and last time I'll wear one of these. Um, Satya Nadella from Microsoft is literally mediating these conversations, right? And again, throughout sort of the afternoon, we start to get more of a, of a trickle of information. Really, honestly, not much happened until very late at night, actually, on Sunday, where <laughs> apparently um, Mira, the, the you know former CTO who had been elevated to interim CEO, had determined at some point over the 
the previous, you know, the preceding two days that she was going to use her new authority to bring Greg and Sam back, which obviously the board wasn't happy about because they had just fired, <laughs> you know, uh, at Sam at least and and demoted Greg. And that apparently caused a um, a battle with Adam D'Angelo, who is one of the board members who's, you know, the CEO of Cora, who was formerly at, at Facebook. And um, and that led to the news that we got around midnight last night that Emmett Shear, the former CEO of Twitch, had been hired to lead the company as new CEO. So we've gone from Sam on Friday morning to Mira on Friday night, you know, through through Sunday afternoon to Emmett Shear on on Sunday night. And uh, and we can talk about Emmett and and what it might represent. But the uh, the sort of the final part of this story from Sunday night early into this morning was that at I think uh, 3 a.m. East Coast time, 2:57, because I spent a lot of time looking at this tweet. Satya Nadella basically tweeted out that they were looking forward to getting to know Emmett and the new OpenAI leadership team, but that Sam and Greg were coming to work at Microsoft. Um, which was just, I, I mean, uh, uh, an outcome that I don't think many people had, even as they started to look at the the full spectrum. I think that the absolute sort of default assumption, should they be unsuccessful in sort of wrenching control back of OpenAI itself, was that these two guys were going to go start their own startup to compete with effectively a blank check from any investor uh, that they wanted. Now, just to, to to finally wrap this up, so we you know we can get into whatever questions you want to sort of take take the direction of. Um, this is where things were this morning at around 8.15 as I, as I set off to drive my, my daughter to school, to kindergarten. And then when I get back, it turns out that OpenAI employees are not content with the arrangement and the way that this is done and had signed a letter demanding the board's resignation, the return of, uh, of Sam and, and Greg. And very impressively, something like 500 out of the 770 employees had signed that when it was announced at like 8.30 a.m. But even more impressively, it turns out that it was only signed by 500 because most of them were sleeping. And so I think you know, at the time that we're recording this, or the last number that I saw from an hour ago, it was something like 735 of the 770 employees had basically said, you know, the board needs to go or we're leaving and we're going to Microsoft with uh, with, with Sam and, and Greg, or at least not staying here, which is uh, astounding because that's probably a higher percentage of the people than Microsoft would have gotten to come over if they had actually acquired the company. So it, it's just this massively strange situation. It is very clear that there is still a battle being waged behind the scenes. Uh, Sam has been dropping, you know, kind of cryptic tweets that don't say much, just, you know, they're sort of vaguely trying to reassure the developer community, I guess, in, in some ways. But we are uh, we are still unresolved, and and in fact, every time someone announces something that sounds like a resolution, um, it has turned out not to be, and has been sort of you know upended within you know six to twelve hours. Yeah, I mean, so it, it, great summation. It, um, Ilya's uh, participation in that final letter saying that he wanted to that he'd lost confidence in the board is the one that's like most perplexing. But again, I feel like. This it just highlights our ignorance at the moment. We're still trying to put pieces together, so we still don't understand to what degree he was pushing for this. He also tweeted out, uh, I guess this was this morning, he tweeted out, I deeply regret my participation in the board's actions. I never intended to harm open AI. I love everything we've built together, and I will do everything I can to reunite the company. Quick question on Emmett's qualifications. Is that is Emmett's qualifications uh, for Emmett, for, uh, Twitch's for, former Twitch CEO, are his qualifications mainly that he's AI? He's on the AI safety camp. Um, it's certainly. I mean, that is the interpretation. So, if you read like Kara Swisher, it's very clear to her that's what the the big thing is. Now, people who know Emmett, I I don't have a dog in the is Emmett a good CEO or not fight. He was CEO of of a very dynamic company that sold to Amazon sort of before and after the sale for eleven years, which is not nothing. You know, he built that company from scratch as a CTO. He's got a reputation as being a very good leader, as a good engineer. Uh, and he's also got a reputation as being very thoughtful and interesting. But the flip side of this is, of course, that like, you know, this is one of, if not the most significant startup in the world right now. It certainly has the sort of, you know, biggest potential for impact. And, um, you know, it, it it took him about 10 minutes to decide that he was going to be the guy. And it kind of seems like they did because... One, he had the qualification of agreeing with them on AI safety things. And two, he was the guy that said yes. It's come out subsequent that Nat Freeman, yeah. who used to run GitHub, has uh, you know said no. 
I, I think one thing that I will note about Emmett, and again, I, I I have a very strong feeling that Emmett's story in this is ultimately going to be a very, very small footnote. But one thing that is notable is that in the sort of, you know, six paragraph or whatever note that he sent uh, out on Twitter uh, last night, like 4 a.m., he said, PPS, before I took the job, I checked on the reasoning behind the change. The board did not remove Sam over any specific disagreement on safety. Their reasoning was completely different from that. I'm not crazy enough to take this job without board support for commercializing our awesome models. So again, this leaves everyone with the question of then what the hell was it? Was it just someone didn't like Sam or didn't like how, what Sam was doing? What could possibly justify this? And the board has been unwilling to make a case. So I feel like so I'm going to hold this question, but what what I wanted to say is that I think it opens up the door to a conversation about uh, OpenAI's role as a nonprofit organization and its relationship to Microsoft and how workable that was, and maybe and maybe and I'll ask this question, then I want to take a few questions. We have some great questions that have already come in. Are we are we too quick to um, sort of? attack the board here and not give them enough of a benefit of the doubt. In other words, how do we know, how do we know they, they their point was that and what they said was that Sam was not being transparent, that they couldn't trust him. Right. So couldn't it be, couldn't there be a lot of truth there? And that maybe in part because of the nature of the enterprise, the fact that it was a nonprofit. I mean, Sam says he has no shares. I don't really know how that works, but that he was, let's say, engaging in um, other deals on the side in order to try to get pieces of other companies that he's potentially working on and trying to start, and that that was also interfering with their ab ability to, with the board's ability to exercise governance. So uh, there's actually two questions embedded here. One is, is it possible that there was a reasonable justification for this based on the actual facts that we haven't heard? And the answer, of course, is yes because we haven't heard. But the second question is whether it, whether it's reasonable to uh, to give the benefit of the doubt when the stakes are this high, when the board refuses to articulate what that is. And the board hasn't even, by the way, come out and said it's too sensitive and could cause harm if we explained what he was being deceptive about. Mm -hmm. They've just said nothing. And so I have a hard time with the argument. Like, look, when, when, I, I think it's a big sort of... Um, well, actuallyism on Twitter right now, when people are like, well, this, the nonprofit board is just exerting their right to do it. It's like, yeah, sure. But like, <laughs> they're not explaining why. And so it's our right as mm -hmm. everyone else to say that that sounds like total bullshit from where we're sitting. I mean, listen, Andre Carpathy said this in a tweet as well during the middle of the whole thing. Someone said something to the effect of, um, you know, it's weird that that Andre, who's, uh, you know, kind of right after this set of people, he's, I mean, he's as, you know, well known, as prominent, as important as any of these folks in, in many ways. And someone said, well, it's weird that he hasn't said anything. And he basically said, I haven't had anything to add because the board has you know, not taken it, the, their chance to explain what their logic was. And so we just kind of have to assume it is what it looks like. And I think that that's a pretty reasonable place to be. Again, they haven't even gone so far as to say something like, you know, there there was there was a safety disagreement that's too important to give publicly, but we stand behind our conviction. They've just said nothing. And it sort of has left everyone to assume that it is actually uh, less significant. And I don't think that people care whether it was technically in the rights of the nonprofit board to do this thing. Lawyers will care when there are, you know, the lawsuits that are inevitably coming down the line. But in the court of public opinion, the the board is basically fully fully wrong, and I don't feel bad for not giving them the benefit of the doubt, given that they haven't taken the chance to actually make an argument. So I'm going to take some listener questions. Richard asks, "How does Microsoft's increased influence and Sam's new role impact the speed and trajectory of OpenAI? What does this say for direction, control, and security?" And I would add to that, uh, Nathaniel, just the larger question of does does Microsoft ultimately come out? Do you think as the biggest winner in all of this? But take my question last. Yeah, I I think that it it certainly puts more pressure on commercialization. I don't think that Satya is lying when he said, you know, in his initial tweet that they've done a they've they've learned a lot over the last half decade around how to let 
companies sort of function on their own more or less, you know, between LinkedIn and GitHub and, and, and this sort of thing. I think that they have done a good job of sort of shifting that. Microsoft is no longer a pariah where like your company, when you sell to it, goes to die in, in quite the same way that it would have been a decade ago, in large part due to changes that have sort of happened on, on Satya's watch. But at the same time, it's a huge company, right? When when this happened, it wiped out $48 billion of market cap in a matter of minutes, right? That's a, a, an enormous amount of pressure and, and not just pressure, but fiduciary responsibility. Microsoft isn't structured in a way where it's their job to think about AI safety issues. Now, they might decide to take it to shareholders and say, we should all be thinking about these issues. But right now, it's it's not their job because they're, they're a public company. They have a very specific mandate that has nothing to do with that. So I think that it, it meaningfully and There are competitive the pressures too. I mean, so the competitive pressures are, seem to be the bigger problem. And the, the case in point, the, the talent drain that happened at OpenAI mm -hmm. is like a perfect example of that. Well, there's there's a larger question of just how inescapable the absolute vortex of the AI arms race is from a commercial perspective. I think that's a really reasonable question. By the way, this is Hinton's main point when he left Google is that that's it's an all consuming thing that he can't imagine how we're going to get out of. I mean, it's a it's a it's a black hole of you know <laughs> of, of pressure. Um, the question is whether Sam and you know the leadership of OpenAI would have more power to resist that pressure at least in some way from where they were versus where they are my general feeling is that as the pole position industry and generation defining startup which they were i mean it is a remarkable achievement that one not only did they kick this whole thing off with chatgpt like i'm just absolutely burying you know the the faces of everyone else with with egg um that GPT-4 hasn't even been close to to touched subsequent to that. You know, Google has just continued to delay Gemini. Amazon is theoretically training something on, you know, uh, with, with that's, that's even bigger than GPT-4, but we haven't seen it yet. Although, you know, it could be announced in, in, in the next couple of weeks. Olympus is the, the code name, apparently. But they were really in the pole position coming into this and, and, and had a huge influence in shaping the nature of the industry. Uh, and I think that they lose that in, in a lot of ways with this. I think it creates a, an opening that allows for more um, sort of more of that commercial pressure, not less to come in. Mm. I also think that, I, you know, maybe I'll invert your question a little bit. I, I think it's possible that Microsoft's a bigger winner, but I still think it's I think that Microsoft had already done a, a phenomenal job. I mean, listen, Microsoft's relationship with OpenAI kind of reset the way that startups and big tech think about each other for this generation of of companies you know that's a, it was a new precedent it was not mm -hmm. an acquisition it wasn't just a straight investment it was very clearly something different but the model has now been sort of semi copied by amazon and google you know in terms of anthropic and mm -hmm. you know part of it's just the the reality of limited you know compute resources to go around but i think that they were in a pretty good position already i mean they were making more money from open ai than open ai was making from you know from open ai um and I think that anything that sort of sows chaos in in the the lead that they had, even if yes, they own sort of more of it ultimately, you know, I, I don't know. I, I I don't I don't think there's I kind of don't think there's any real winners in this. Mm. Basically, I think the biggest loser is the AI safety uh, field. Mm. Well, we'll have to get to that. So I'm going to take another Microsoft question here and skip around a bit. Nima asks two really great questions. So one is, if the majority of the OpenAI team moves to Microsoft and others are poached by competitors. What do you believe will be the impact of this event on the competitive dynamic and landscape in, our, in artificial intelligence? Could it, in fact, better level the field among large language models? And then the second question is, if a regulatory movement grows to slow down acceleration, is Microsoft a more susceptible target for regulatory scrutiny? So both, both really great questions. Uh, my answer is... Yeah, my answer is yes and yes. So yes, I think that uh, it, it does have the potential to create less of a, I mean, by listen, by weakening the the company that I was sort of arguing is in the pole position, you inherently create a space where there is more, uh, there's more equivalence. Let's say, right? There, there's there's more room to catch up, and I think that that is almost a. Uh, I don't see how that doesn't happen to some extent in the sense that. Developers in particular, who OpenAI had just extra won over, you know, with with Dev Day relative to where they had sat, you know, before November sixth, um, have to be very 
questioning, you know, what, what they're going to do kind of going forward and how much they're going to invest in the, in the, you know, the chat GPT and open AI ecosystem versus, you know, working with other models, whether they're closed or open, um, I, you know, and so uh, I, I do think that that, you know, there, there's an argument that it's ultimately a good thing for the world to not have a single dominant force. Um, the flip side is I think that that's probably counteracted a little bit by increased concentration in the hands of Microsoft. You know, I think uh, a frenemy relationship between OpenAI and Microsoft is probably net better for the world than a, a fully absorbed relationship. But, you know, it's it's hard to say. Those things are going to take a while to, to blame out. Um, but I think that the question of whether there's going to be more, uh, if it creates more of a target for, you know, regulatory scrutiny is absolutely, you know. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a question of sort of will it actually be able to happen exactly as, uh, you know, as intended or will there be antitrust suits? I mean, you know, creates all sorts of new questions that they were always probably going to have to deal with at some point as that relationship evolved, but are, you know, coming, coming a lot faster now. So Sandeep asks, if the Accelerate and Commercialize crowd wins out at OpenAI, do you see dangers of AI going the route of nuclear energy? Some scary near misses end up setting progress back by decades? The Silicon Valley mindset seems to be the, ap the that absolute. The Silicon Valley mindset seems to be that absolutely nothing can be permitted to hold back tech by even one extra day. What are your thoughts? Yeah, on that? well, because this so, gets us into the conversation about safety versus. Yeah, th there's a, there's a couple couple things in here that I think are really interesting and, and worth pulling out. And Dimitri, this is a conversation that you and I actually ha have a have a lot. <laughs> um, I do think that. Silicon Valley does represent the position almost always that tech is sort of a natural good that benefits the world, uh, that that the net byproduct of almost all technology is good for the world. And, you know, they have lots of evidence that they point to, but that is sort of Silicon Valley's position. Um, they've done a good job over the last 20 years of, you know, basically dragging the rest of the world along with them that nothing should slow down or impede progress and that technology is, is you know, kind of coming at you. Uh, whether whether you want it or not. Now, I would argue, and this is a little bit of probably out of scope of this conversation, that that was not just Silicon Valley uh, sort of you know stumbling into power, but also had to do with you know sort of big political decisions, such as the decision to sort you know I mean globalization decisions and the way that that impacted uh, the economics of America. Right, we we traded the sort of you know jobs for cheaper stuff, and uh, and a lot of what has come from technology, we're not so sure actually sort of net benefited us. But Silicon Valley is always going to represent that position. I, I don't think it's particularly unusual or surprising. I think a, a bigger question is sort of, you know, where the rest of the world is going to fall when it comes to that. And frankly, that's why I think you're seeing such intense and vicious narrative warfare between sort of the forces of, you know, pause, slow down, AI safety, effective altruism, I mean, whatever subdivision of that whole set of things. And, you know, on the other hand, the sort of accelerationists, because they know there are big stakes at play here. They're, they're all, you know, these are positions held by sub 5% of the world, you know, or, or call it America, if we just want to define the parameters of, you know, American, uh, Americans who are going to be involved in American policy decisions. I think that the vast, vast majority of people don't really have a strong perspective on this yet because a it's new b it's complicated c you know it's kind of a reasonable default position to take to say if a lot of researchers are at least reasonably concerned that there's a lot of risk here we should probably take that seriously even if we also see a lot of the upside right i think a lot of people are finding themselves in the middle and an admittedly uninformed middle as they're trying to get up to speed with it and so, you know, the two poles are, are are really aggressively trying to pull them in either direction. Silicon Valley, because I think it's it's existential in a way that's not just um, about AI, but it's about whether the, the the tech industry can continue to sort of dominate the 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 conversation and and sort of do do no wrong, or at least get its way, even if it's been you know sort of said to do wrong. And on the other hand, it's existential because the people literally think it's existential <laughs> from the standpoint of whether human humanity survives. So the the the, the narrative stakes are, are quite high. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, on the existential side is I mean well established, but this idea that. Silicon that Silicon Valley is banking on this as being the new technological paradigm, and the ability yeah. to develop to develop that unencumbered, or the, the the fear that they might be encumbered in trying to develop that is something that's freaking out a lot of people. It is, and it's it's interesting to me why that is. I don't have a good 
I don't fully have a good explanation yet for why there is sort of such intensity around this. Um, I think that it's probably like anything, a, a variety of positions where I think that there are probably in the same way that there are people on the side of sort of AI safety who very genuinely believe their P doom to use sort of the, you know, the expression that's used in those circles a lot, their probability of doom, the, the percentage chance they ascribe to sort of a, a human life ending event is very high. Uh, and they believe that realistically. I think that there's probably the inverse of that on the accelerationist side who think that genuinely, I mean, these, you know, AI will, if given the chance in 10 years, solve cancer and solve, you know, and, and all these things which sort of prevent human flourishing. And so it becomes, you know, uh, I mean, Mark Andreessen literally argued that it's an act, it's a form of violence to not allow this to proceed in his techno optimist manifesto. Um, then I think you have others who are just sort of genuine or generally think that, um, you know, the, the AI safety folks are sort of crying about nothing and making fallacious arguments and it's stupid, you know, and then you have sort of the libertarian set who doesn't want sort of government to to be involved in this and say, you know, if, if they do this, then, you know, where does it stop? And, you know, so there, there's all these different dimensions. It's not a coalition. Yeah, those people are always off the, those people are always yeah. way, way off center. Um, the sort of no regulation. This is like Davy Crockett's America is so totally missing the ball. Actually, you know, this point about power, I think is actually central. And I've something I've talked about. It's not a coincidence that we got uh, democratic reforms and and move towards more pluralistic systems of representation after the end of the bubonic plague and the price of labor went up. Labor was empowered. And with the, with the empowerment of labor, you got the empowerment of civic bodies and, and, the, and the population, people. And I think that it's also not a coincidence that we've seen um, increased fragmentation and rising populism and political dissatisfaction in Western democracies since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rise of globalization, which disempowered labor in these Western countries. And also technology also appropriated more power towards capital against labor. And so you've seen this move of disempowerment of labor relative to capital. And AI represents the apotheosis of this. You know, it is it is the um, the singularity. You know, not to just the quote Ray Kurzweil, but truly, uh, it's it's a massive concentration of power. And I do wonder to what degree we're also what we see in the case of the acceleration accelerationists is a recognition of that, a recognition of that they are on the cusp of a massive. And I don't mean it in a twirling your mustache kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I just mean it in a kind of fundamental way. They see it. It's this is where it's going. They want to be on the side of the, the people that have the power in what could end up being a feudalistic type of global society, um, which kind of, again, reverses all the gains of the breakdown of feudalism that happened after the end of the bubonic plague, plague in Europe. So um, another question someone asks, Michael asks, if the board is motivated by safety concerns, is it naive for a software vendor to think that they have any meaningful influence over the trajectory of AI technology when hardware progress will inevitably continue producing capabil capabilities, ca producing improvements in capabilities for the foreseeable future? So I'm not entirely sure. I think I understand where he's going, but I don't quite get it as a question, but maybe you do. So what do you think of that? What's your what's your sort of response to that, Nathaniel? Maybe I'll I'll reframe it a little bit. And apologies to the to the person who asked the question if this is not sort of the the direction that that it was going. But I feel like the question is: um, Is it naive for anyone to swim against the tide when the tide is sort of so clearly pointed in the other direction? Right? Like, is it is it naive for this to for this board to have thought? that this would meaningfully impact anything, even if they were completely successful and Sam and Greg just sort of quietly went into the night. Um, I, it sort of is, is the answer a little bit. Mostly in terms of execution, though, not in terms of principle, right? I think one of the real travesties of this, if it, if it really was executed the way that it the way that it was, which is there not being some insane, egregious sort of, you know, inflection point moment when it comes to AI safety and the capacity of these systems, is that this body spent their most powerful tool on bullshit, it kind of seems like, you know, I mean, listen, the structure that they set up theoretically to create a nonprofit that could fire the CEO of, you know, this incredibly important startup, work dish in the sense that it, you know they did fire the ceo of this thing but you know was this the right time to do it did it you know it feels like it's just going to end up sort of you know turning some amount of narrative against 
the AI safety folks because they look, you know, very sort of, you know, uh, chicken little-ish. There's, you know, the 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 fact that it seems likely that Sam's going to consolidate power after this and no longer be an ally to that group in any meaningful way. Certainly Silicon Valley is now on a McCarthy-esque, you know, witch hunt to try to root out all the effective altruists, you know, the at, at their organizations. Of course, I'm overstating the case, you know, to 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 make the point, but um, you know, I don't know. It's it's a uh, it, it it it's not naive on the very broadest level to think that there are chances to drag the world toward the better a little bit. And you're never going to convince humans that they can't do that. It's what makes us who we are to be optimistic about the capacity to divert things, which seem like they have momentum such that they can't possibly be diverted. The problem is that the very American, of this very one, American, not necessarily very human. I, I think know. it's fairly. I think it's fairly. It's certainly more American, but I think it's fairly human in terms of sort of the sense of you know uh, of agency to exert will over the world. I think that's pretty quintessential to humanity. But so George way, has a way question field now. <laughs> so so George has a question on governance that I want to ask before that. Kelly a- a- asks a question about Elon and and anything we know about Elon's involvement. So Elon, we do know, was involved in OpenAI and its founding. He's also recently started a AI company. I don't know to what degree that is just a, a LARP or some kind of um, you know thing, performative act, again, to generate a media hype and excitement, whatever, and how much of it's substantive. But what is there any involvement for Elon here? Like what, and how is he, Elon's always trying to find some way to, you know, get some kind of action, whatever it is, whether it's attention or whether it's material, but like, how has he, has he featured in this story at all? I don't, my read is no, in, in this particular instance, and, and how I'll qualify it is that <laughs> Elon has two chaos modes. Either I create the chaos or I benefit from the chaos. I don't think that he created the chaos here. I think that this was done, yeah. you know, outside of him. However, he is enormously talented at benefiting from the chaos. And there was a while before Ilya sent that message this morning where I thought one of the most natural outcomes for this would be Ilya moving over to, you know, to XAI. Great, great prediction. Um, and, uh, and sort of, you know, I mean, Elon has taken a stance of being closer to what it appears that Ilya feels relative to Sam, certainly not a full sort of pause or, you know, or, or anything like that, but, you know, at least giving lip service to that side of things. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I, but Elon is never far from the surface of things, and he's going to be a major player in this. Mm. Um, for those who aren't paying attention closely, outside of even just Grok and sort of like the anti woke chat GPT bot and stuff, you know, Tesla is has a, a, a some of the most advanced artificial intelligence in the world. You know, they're um, the way that they are doing full self driving is. Uh, is they're they're inferring on site, right? They are taking in all of that information from all of the cameras on that vehicle and making decisions in real time, uh, which is a a real world sort of AI that basically no one else has the way that they do. And it's not hard to start to see how this incredible trove of conversational data from uh, Twitter slash X plus that. Uh, you know, sort of inference capacity that comes from real world sort of, you know, data in the form of all the, you know, the fleet of Tesla cars that are out there collecting it, you know, combines into their robot, which, which brings sort of all of these things together into, you know. Who would you say are the big players in the AI fund for among AI, found, among AI foundation models? It's a very small handful. There's OpenAI, there's Anthropic, which was a split out from OpenAI. There's XAI, who is you know new, but you, you just have to give Elon credit and call that sort of the representative of the entirety of Elon stuff, inclusive. And his LLM is Grok, right? Yes, yep, Inclu- inclusive of of Grok and Tesla and all that. Uh, there's you know Microsoft is really sort of you know aligned with uh, with OpenAI on that. They do technically have you know they just announced the next generation of their sort of own LLM, but it's so clearly secondary to what they're doing with with OpenAI. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, Google, who are sort of far behind at this point, uh, which is which is a whole very interesting thing. Um, Meta, who are sort of have taken this sort of leadership position in the open space approach. Um, and Amazon, who, again, they sort of got pushed out of the way by OpenAI, but are now, you know, they, they've sort of moved into professional services. 
uh, with Bedrock and helping enterprises sort of train models. But it seems like their ambition to have a competitor is still there. Obviously, they need it for um, for to power sort of Alexa devices and things like that to, to some extent. Mm. Apple's a big question mark. They are now from all reports, spending millions of dollars a day training their own models, although it still seems unclear exactly what they're going to do. It kind of seems like their focus is to get the technology sufficiently advanced that they can actually run these things on device so they don't have to deal with the cloud. Um, and then there's a, a, this whole cadre of sort of open source you know, approaches, uh, which are, you know, so, too numerous to list, but there's Mistral, there's stability, there's all the hugging face models. I mean, there's, there's a huge array of things sort of building in, in that space as well. So all of you can hear just how uh, well versed uh, Nathaniel is in this industry. So he he is the AI splainer. If you need a podcast <laughs> to listen to where you can download stuff every five minutes, it's Nathaniel. So George asks, is this a symptom of problems with governance, both in the tech space and in the nonprofit space? I'm troubled because nonprofit does not mean you are, quote, doing good the way many folks think. It just means essentially you, you are essentially you essentially get to dodge taxation and operate under less regulatory scrutiny. Yeah, I, I think that it it there are uh, indictments to go around in terms of governance here. But I think that for me, the the to the extent that we are looking for things which we should sink our teeth into and ask questions of how we're going to sort of not do this again or or fix this, I think that it comes back to questions of AI governance specifically. What is what and really it's an even more simple question is what are, if anything, the guardrails around these these sort of frontier models and the advancement of this space? And you know, in many ways, I think that you can view OpenAI's nonprofit sort of weird structure as a self-regulatory approach trying to create those guardrails in the absence of their, being, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a state level guardrail or, or anything like that. Um, and it has clearly not worked. And I think it's very hard to argue after this, that the approach that they set out to do, you know, sort of worked or, you know, worked without consequence. Um, it's being put to the test, you know, a, a, as we speak. But again, it's sort of, to me, it's less relevant, almost like it, whether or not OpenAI's model worked and more like, what is going to be the set of guardrails around this, if anything? And, you know, and that's that's in many ways what the battle, you know, around the AI safety question is, is who's going to get to determine, you know, what companies can and can't do in this space. So Leo asks a question about adoption. Do you see this impacting AI adoption anyway? I don't, I don't see no. it. If anything, it just accelerates it. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the thing that makes AI weird relative to other hypey technologies of which I have a lot of familiarity with, you know, pre previous hypes is that it's it's just actually good. I think, you know, one of the most dismissible opinions to me when it comes to AI is the sort of, well, actually, it's not even that good. It's just predicting words and all this sort of stuff. Like it, it's really good. These things are transformational technologies. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I don't think that homework is ever going to happen again <laughs> as it as it happened when we were growing up. I think that uh, you know, the way that writing happens is totally going to change. I think blah, 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 blah. I could go on for, for an endless list, yeah. but those things aren't, those aren't mandated from above and they're not just from hype They're because people try these things and they're like, oh, that's a much better, more efficient, more powerful way to do things that I was doing. And in fact, opens up new things that I could never do before. So uh, this is a question from Michael, which I think is interesting. Um, he says, it doesn't seem like the policy regulation narrative for semiconductor export controls and AI safety have been coordinated. Hidden Forces has covered some of the semiconductor controls, and AI safety voices haven't come up. Are there people interested in AI safety or in the effective altruism community or anywhere else that are advocating for hardware controls in the interest of AI safety? So I would just say, obviously, there are in the sense that the semiconductor export controls are in some ways a attempt to slow down progress in AI, but specifically for the Chinese based on limiting their exposure to hardware. But the question is, is that also something that regulators are looking at, Nathaniel, do you know, with respect to US and American corporations? Um, yes. So one of the potential regulatory approaches, now this is a fairly extreme one, but it's, it's something that's sort of a potential outcome even of the executive order is 
um, the U.S. government at least having visibility into who's using compute. So one of the easy vectors for them to start having some amount of control is to force the cloud computing providers, so the Amazons and Googles of the world, to let them know when a certain customer is using over a certain threshold of compute. Now, this is something that's going to be fought incredibly viciously. I mean, just insanely tooth and nail fought. But if you know the the government's trying to understand who's you know doing massive training runs before they happen and and you know want, want sort of visibility into that they do have access to this information potentially through the you know through the the, the compute providers uh, to get that so the short answer to the question is yes the government is is looking into ways to have access to that sort of like hardware level visibility at least if not straight up control um, I haven't seen proposals yet to give the government authority to actually green light uh you know the usage of compute most of the sort of green lighting type proposals or you know uh, licensing type proposals are farther downstream where you know if maybe there is a sort of a, a red teaming requirements testing requirements and the government says you know gets to say no you can't deploy that sort of model because it's too advanced or something but i haven't seen yet a restriction of compute um but uh, uh, an obs observation of compute is is definitely on the agenda so what is, in your opinion, if you had to guess, what is the next use case or next s small number of use cases that you think are going to um, serve as the next kind of paradigm shift in the consumer's or the user's mind about really how transformative this technology is going to be? I actually think, so I think that we've spent a lot of this year um, following along the progress of like a new thing to come out, you know, every every few days. And I think a lot of next year is going to be about um, integrating the stuff that's already here into workflows in, in really practical ways. So building interfaces on top of things like ChatGPT and Anthropics Claude that are custom purpose for, you know, profession X or role Y, you know, that, that are just add a layer. Again, it's, it's almost a UX layer. You know, the capacity of GPT-4 is very high. And of course, engineers are going to be excited and focused on GPT-5, but there's so much in GPT-4. But, you know, if right now, the only way that people are interacting with it by and large is sort of, you know, the, a blank screen that's a cursor that says, you know, what can I help you with? And I think that that's going to change a lot this year. And and I think that, you know, we'll move from, a, you know, a, just a pure kind of early adopter set, although there's, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of early adopters, you know, doing, you know, all sorts of experiments with these things to, I don't know, accountants saying, here's how we use this tool and other accountants copying them, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times, right? I think you'll see social media managers say, you know, here's how we do content calendaring, you know, blah, 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 blah. I think that's going to be, I think actually it's going to be a much more boring sort of integrated period. Now it'll be punctuated by like mind blowing things, the likes of which you've never seen, but um, you know, that'll be, that'll be sort of contrasted with this just the sort of steady flow of these tools into, into actual human workflows. I have one last question for you, Nathaniel. Um, give us the name of one or more books, and this might be hard because this is such a new field. Uh, books that you would recommend for people that are interested in learning about this field and also other sources, like how do you educate yourself in real time and stay up to date? What are some good journals, some good online magazines, some good people to follow besides you that you follow to help uh, stay up to breast on this industry? Yeah. I don't know if books are the right way to go <laughs> for this. I think where books can be helpful is books can create a really good grounding for particularly some of the AI safety debates. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of text there. It, it kind of delves into philosophy. Um, Nick when Bostrom's it comes, Super Intelligence, which came it, out exactly, like seven years, eight years ago. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that. that sort of thing is, is there. Um, in terms of keeping track of this, it's fascinating because there's this whole new core of content creators that are that are sort of just emerging now. Um, and, and I think they're actually quite good. Like you don't have the sort of shilliness, I mean, a little bit on X because that's just the nature of the platform, but you don't have the same sort of shilliness that you see like with crypto YouTubers that you do with AI YouTubers. You know, there's some great people like Matt Wolf who have, you know, created these channels that are just pure value. You know, Matt Berman is another person who explains things. He's more technical. Um, but there's, you know, there's a handful of those now there's, you know, a dozen or something like that. Um, I think in terms of people to follow from a news standpoint, I think that, uh, and I'm sort of not biased. I, I go wherever the information is good. The information, which is the information.com is by a million light years, mm. the best newsroom when it comes to AI. Like, I mean, it's just, 
uh, yeah, everyone is everyone every, is citing them. Everybody's every, citing every them. scoop is yeah. that. Now, I, I think that is testament to the fact that AI has brought tech back to San Francisco and Silicon Valley specifically in a in a way that looked like maybe it had lost during COVID, um, because it's mm. you know there, there's such a it matters once again to have this incredible concentration of actual sort of frontier brain power. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it sort of returned and the information is where they're strong is in those actual geographic ecosystems where their people who are writing for them have relationships with people who would go into those companies and things like that. But, um, they're a great source on Twitter. Uh, it sounds silly, but one really great resource is Robert Scoble. He's been a like tech obsessed, you know, guy he's, uh, like loves technology always has been an evangelist for various things. He just created a new, um, a new show called unaligned, which I actually haven't even seen, but mm. what he's been doing is trying to curate the entire world of X users, uh, on AI into lists. So he's got a list for X companies. He's got a list for X artists. And I've found that lists don't usually stick as the way that people sort of interact with Twitter. But they're a great way to, if you're trying to figure out like who you actually like, you go mm -hmm. check out one of Scoble's lists and then you end up kind of finding like two or three people who come up over and over and over again, and you follow them and you know, you're in a good spot, but it's a, it's a, it's a field that rewards finding, you know, new voices and, and new people, but um, it's going to keep changing too, I think. So how do people follow you besides following NLW at NLW on Twitter or X, as you call it, I still haven't. I know. I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm that, me neither. I'm how else do people it. follow you? How do they find the podcast? Like, what's the best way to to like take advantage of all the things that you have to offer, Nathaniel? If if you are an audio listener, the AI breakdown. If you search the AI breakdown, um, you'll know it's mine because it's sort of got a, uh, a, a, a an old retro futurist kind of like '50s image on the on the cover. Um, with a little robot guy at the center of a family. Uh, that's the, you know, you can find it on any, any podcast platform. Um, the YouTube is, uh, I think it's youtube.com slash at AI Breakdown or AI Breakdown Pod maybe or, or something like that. But it's, uh, you know, if you search my name, Nathaniel Whittemore, you search the AI Breakdown, it'll be there. If you're a visual consumer, every podcast episode is actually two videos on YouTube. Um, and then breakdown.network has uh, all the information about other stuff. There's a discord, there's a newsletter. Um, and then there's also, you know, we're, we're now kind of moving into the world of, of learning communities. So I've, I've got a, a beta educational learning community that's coming together in uh, December. I decided to pull the trigger on it. Well, you know, I'm very excited to hear about that, Nathaniel. So uh, thank you so much for coming on, man. This was awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I always, always love chatting, Dimitri. All right. Have a good one. Bye everybody. Yeah, too.